Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 279 for March 20th of 2015. Ford sharpens its edge. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific or 19 hours GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Gary. Hey, we meet again in the yeah, studio. Yeah, it's been it's been minutes. It's been minutes because we were both at a, a press conference at Ford just a little bit ago, yeah. and I was at another one at FCA before that. Maybe we'll, talk, we'll talk about, about both of those, both yeah, of those later in the show. But we got to let everybody know we got Aaron Bragman, hello from Cars.com. Yeah. Great having you back here. Thank you. Good to be here. And of course, we got to let everyone know we got our special guest here, Scott Smith, the program manager on the all new. Not just new, all new Ford engine. Great having you here, man. I am thrilled to be here. I'm, I was telling you earlier, I'm a little bit of an auto line uh, groupie. Every Sunday I'm watching it, and I try and catch it every day. That's awesome. Don't tell anyone, <laughs> don't tell anyone at work, but I do catch it every once in a while. So you've run the whole program for this, this new one. So my background is before the... Before this edge, I was the engineering manager at Oakville Assembly. And in I had, Canada. In Canada. And where I you had, build it. I'm sorry? Where you build Where we edge. build the car. And I had responsibility for the, the outgoing edge engineering-wise. So you knew everything that had to get fixed. I knew, uh, I knew what our customers' wants and needs were. And I moved into the new edge program just before we started building prototypes. So um, probably the best job I've ever had, taking that kind of knowledge from production into something that's never been built yet, and it was tremendous. So what, what advantage does that give you? Well, I, obviously the, the customer base, I knew it, I knew what they complained about, and I knew what they loved. And when you, when you bring that to the new car, it's kind of like fresh eyes for engineers who have been working on things over and over and over, or parking technology. You know, they're, they're really working on parking technology, and sometimes they don't remember what the customer really wants. Bringing that kind of knowledge, I think it helped a lot. How'd the launch go? Launch was fantastic. It was uh, scheduled as a 15 mile year. It launched as a 15 mile year, and cars have started shipping. I'm happy to say so. Dealers should be seeing it now. As a matter of fact, I think we sold our first one last week. So it's got to be good to have a plant guy running the program, especially when it comes to launch. It does. Uh, you know which names to take and which asses to kick. Well, the relationships, <laughs> the relationships with the Oakville Assembly Complex remain. So um, you're right. We do know how to call and how to get things done. And I, I have to be honest, the Oakville Assembly Complex, world class. The people there, they deliver every single day. Well, and this, this vehicle is significantly different than the outgoing vehicle. It's, what, it, four inches longer? or It's, uh, it's about three and a half inches longer. Well, wait, wait, it's big thing. This is based on the Fusion platform, so Mondeo platform. Let me give you the whole, yeah, the whole yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, do. It's all new. There's a couple components that are carryover. We have a carryover 3.5 engine, but everything else on the car is new for Edge. It's based off of our midsize, CUV, or midsize car platform. Fusion comes off of it, S-Max in Europe. It has a two-liter engine now, a, a twin-scroll EcoBoost two-liter engine as its base engine. has a 2.7 in the Sport that is a rocket ship. Uh, all new sheet metal outside, all new interior. It's just a fantastic vehicle. Now, so it took a lot of work in the plant to... Well, 500 and I think it was $80 million of retooling Oakville Assembly wow. to... Uh, to put this in, and a lot of craftsmanship goes in there. You know, we put robots in, we put measurement tools, and that plant still builds Flex, MKT, and soon the MKX up there as well. So, tremendous work out in Oakville. Moving to that new platform, you're able to put a lot more electronic technology in this thing as well. I mean, the it's, technology yeah. in here, when, when we put together this edge, there was a lot of discussion around what do we want to do, and technology rose right to the top, and, and as we go through, there's tons of technology, new for us, parking technology, and camera technology and other things that you've seen on other cars, hands-free liftgate and moonroofs, that the list is, is very extensive and the car has so much technology, it really helps you out when you're driving. Now, I'm sure the company moved this to the, the Fusion slash Mondeo platform because you know, you get economy of scale and all that stuff. But what about weight? Were you able to so, take weight out of do, doing this? 
we took out 49 pounds. Now that's, that's a big number. It's not, you know, it's not giant, but 49 pounds. We put so much technology back in. Um, let me rephrase that. We put technology in and still took out 49 pounds. So we did do a that's nice job. Good. Yeah, it is pretty nice, especially when you see the list of technologies that are in it. How, how long was this program in gestation and execution? It's the standard Ford process. So, um, you know, it's proprietary, but it's, it's three to four years of hard work. You know, we start in the studio just like everybody else, and then we build prototypes and we finally get into the production. Uh, I think it was about June last year when we started building cars in the plant. Now, when we did our television program recently, we had Joe Henricks on. He says Ford's actually added some time back into PD. Did you do that on this program? We're really focused on quality. So there's a lot of internal metrics that we have to meet for us to g continue to the next milestone. So there is some time added in there, but it's for the better. You know, if we, if we find something that isn't meeting our internal requirements, we stop, we rethink, we fix, and then we go forward. Mm -hmm. You've gone with a new engine strategy for this one versus the last edge. The last one had the standard, the V6 was standard. and V5 was standard. You'd upgrade to the two liter turbo, but now you've switched that around. Yeah, the, uh, we really prioritized a little bit better fuel mileage for our base vehicle. That mm. The two liter EcoBoost is really nice engine. And now mm -hmm. that base car gets um, 20, 30, 24. So 24 average miles per gallon. Uh, a nice improvement from where we were with the 3.5. The 3.5 is still available. It's a great engine, but we're really focused on, on a little bit of better fuel economy for the, the customer. At the very top of things, there's a sport model as that well. That 2.7 yeah. engine, uh, it's incredible. And it's only available in the sport, and we don't have a sport here today, but I'm sure you can see it online. The appearance of it's great. The 2.7, the power in the car, it's a V6 EcoBoost engine. Uh, we drove it last week in mm -hmm. Scottsdale, and it is just a rocket ship. It is so fun to drive. What do you, what do you target with that versus like the base model edge? Is it a different customer? So the customer, the, our customer base is varied, mm -hmm. um, but it's for the customer that wants everything, wants this people mover, and yet still wants to have fun in the car. And I think we've delivered that fun both in driving dynamics and in power. And it's got a nice package, too. I was on that program in oh. Scottsdale and, and drove it. And, the uh, interior's beautiful, and we mm -hmm. changed some things. The front end grill has changed. Uh, you get different fascia tre treatments. The claddings are body color. The wheels, you can get a 21-inch black wheel. It just makes the car something <laughs> special. But no more 22s. They used to have 22s on the last No one. more 22s. Those are gone. That's true, but we're going to maintain that fun and the appearance. We fill that wheel well up really tight now. It looks you know, beautiful. The, the big wheels look terrific, but they don't ride as yeah. well. I thought they looked a little awkward, quite frankly. I thought it looked a little too big for the shape of the car, but apparently, you're right, they didn't ride very well at all, and it had to have been an unsprung mass thing as well. But that's well, on everyone. I'm not just yeah, saying yeah. on the edge. Yeah. yeah, we're anxious to see what our customers feel with, this, with the new sport package, because mm -hmm. I think it's great. I think the team thinks it's great. We can't wait for it to get out in the marketplace. It surprised me most about that that 27 v6 and the thing was that it sounded like an old volvo five cylinder it sounded a little discordant and had a kind of a rasp to it that was really quite a you were there as well weren't you do did you have the same experience mm -hmm. in the in the v6 mm -mm. no 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 oh. i guess it's just me the other thing that i like about what you've Different done cars. with this is a lot more interior room so I mean, it's it's longer it's taller and we really paid attention to package, not just in the behind the second row seat. We paid attention to package in the, the collar or the center console, the glove box. We added the the uh, the uh, bin door above the IP. So the customers like to put stuff in places. We even have an umbrella holder on the side of the seat. So we did pay a lot of attention to giving them room to put things. So you were saying that you had the familiarity with what consumers had said about the first hmm. vehicle. I mean, and there were a lot of those sold, so there's a lot of people out there who own edges. So, I mean, what are some of the things that you have in this new vehicle that if somebody owns an edge right now and they're thinking, you know, I'm gonna get a new car, but should I get an edge? Should I get, you know, go someplace else? I mean, yeah. what did you put in this thing? So, number one, the driving dynamics are just fantastic. So the driving experience itself is great. Number two, wind noise. The actual quietness of the cabin. We have done so much work on making sure that the driver and the passenger is sealed from the outside noise. And then number three, I mean, the elephant in the room is when we launched Sync, there were some issues with it. We now, if you ask JD Power, IQS says that we are the number one, and it's going to continue to get better. So that customer interface is uh, fantastic now. Mm -hmm. I was wondering why there wasn't Sync 3. So Sync 3 is 
is planned for Ford. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to come out when we have completed our internal launch of it, and it mm -hmm. comes out later this year is the plan. And it'll come out across the board. Will it go as a running change for this? Because the, the ones we saw for here had the older style right. sink. Yeah. But this is a 2015 car, a 2015 and then you'll have a 2016, 2016 car, launch. and then you're going to get your right. number 2016 three. 2016 car is what we're planning to launch gotcha. Sync Gen 3 in. Scott, another thing, too. Ford's putting not just backup cameras, but forward-looking cameras. Oh, Talk about that and so why. When we were in Scottsdale, we had uh, two transits parked with a spot between us, and we backed a, uh, an edge into it. And this new front camera technology that we have on the car, you hit a button and it shows you normal, and then you hit it again and it shows you 180 degrees. So you actually can look down the street without moving the car to make sure it's safe before you park or pull out. The other thing we've added is we've added sensors on the sides of the car at the rear edges, at the rear edge of the front fascia and at the forward edge of the rear fascia. And that allows you to get 360 degree coverage. So if you're pulling out of a parking garage, for instance, and there's a pole, you know exactly how tight you are when you're turning a corner to that pole, visually and audibly. So much safer in this car and much, much safer for the car itself against poles. I mean, it's very clever, that forward camera sensor that you have, the way you have a washer to keep it clean. So there is a washer jet. Obviously, in the front of the car, it's going to get hit with bugs and things like that. So we did package a washer jet as well, and it works every time you... You wash the windshield, you wash that front, front camera. See, I love that. I, I can't tell you how many times this past winter I've gotten into cars to back up and there's snow or ice or water or something oh, yeah. on the lens yeah. and rendering the backup camera almost impossible to use. It might be a northern Midwestern problem. It might be, <laughs> but still, I love this little washer thing. Yeah, it's, it's the way to go. The edge doesn't have it on the rear. It's in the front. It's in the front. Um, Explorer will have the first rear wash uh, yeah. for our launch later this year, and it's an opportunity in the very near future for us as well. Now, i got to ask, you must have worked on the Lincoln version of this, too. I, I did not work on the oh, Lincoln okay. version, so um, it's going to be a great product. The Edge is a great product, but I can't help you with uh, details on the MKS. Gotcha. You know, i, I got to ask you, so, so it has this parallel parking feature that it will back into the space, mm. which was rather clever and unnerving, yeah. but... Um, <laughs> Why, why is it that the, the operator has to operate the pedals? So just a little bit about the technology first. So we have parallel park. We had that in the pre we've had it in previous models. We've added uh, park out for parallel park, and that's for when you park parallel and somebody comes in after you and maybe pulls a little closer and you're uncomfortable with backing out. You hit this button and it will maneuver the car out. The customer utilize, or manages the gas and the brake. And then we have perpendicular park where it will sense a spot and it will back you into the spot. Um, your question was... Well, why do you need... Why, why does the operator use the pedal? So you're saying, why isn't it just autonomous? Why don't we just do yeah, it, huh? Yeah. Well, it's an opportunity for the future. Right now, I don't think that we have clear way forward to get that without any bugs in it, but we're working on it. Again, an opportunity. This technology, though, fantastic. I, I know you said it was a little bit unnerving, but after you get used to it, it's something you use all the time. It's like a keypad or a heated steering wheel. Mm -hmm. When you park, this thing centers you between the cars, right. and it's just fantastic. No, the unnerving part is, is that you're seeing it on the camera in the, in the display, and you're like, oh, it's going to hit it. You know? it and, well, and, uh, what I'm impressed is the Ford system absolutely works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I've tried Brand L, and yes. it could never, ever get it to no, work. No, no, no. And you guys are deploying this on all kinds of cars, up and down the price range, and nobody else has pretty much followed you on this. Yeah, I, uh, I, we're pretty much the leader in technology with respect to parking, so pretty proud of that, and it is going to expand, like you said, autonomous parking. <clears throat> it's obviously an opportunity in the future, and it's going to come. Hopefully, we're the first ones to do it. It's a lot of fun to do with people who are in the passenger seat who have never experienced that kind of thing before. Mm -hmm. You pull up, you push the button, you take your hands off, and the wheel's doing its thing, and people freak out. Yeah, it's there's some great fun. videos online. <laughs> oh, yeah. You should watch people. <laughs> <laughs> they're, uh, they're really surprised. I, I might have done that before once mm -hmm. or twice, yeah. So, so we have a view of the camera right here and showing the, the enormous amount of space in the back. Um, what what, what uh, cubic capacity do you I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. It increased by about 12%. The other thing that you see there, you see the second row seats fold back so that you can obviously put a lot of, a lot of material in there. Well, second row seats are also reclining, so when they're up, you can get added comfort. And we've added um, 
There's the tilt switch. We've added heat to the rear seats now, too, so more comfort for the passengers. Really? Yeah. yeah it's... I tell you, that's one of the greatest inventions that's ever come along in automobiles is heated <laughs> seats. <laughs> auto, auto start or uh, remote that's start, favorite, heated yeah. steering wheel and heated yeah, seats. Yeah. The most important things here in the Midwest. And, and you mentioned another one, uh, uh, second row seats that recline. Yeah, we had it in the previous Edge. Again, from my experience, the customers love it. They absolutely, you know, you're not sitting up straight all the time. If you want to lean back a little in the second row, the opportunity is there for you. It makes a big difference, mm -hmm. especially it, on a long trip. I rode, uh, I rode quite a bit in the second row last week, two hours at a time, and I tell you, I was comfortable the entire time. You could hear the drivers, you could hear the discussion, and it was comfort. Mm -hmm. Except when the journalists were actually driving, of course. That yeah, was yeah. a little nerve-wracking, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. It makes, makes me ill. It was very nauseous. <laughs> oh, yeah. For China, you've got a three-row model. So the Edge... Uh, it launches in Oakville here for North America, and that'll ship to South America. It's, it's shipping now. Right, right behind it, we are launching the export version of the Edge, and it will go to Europe. That'll have diesel engines as well as right-hand drive. Mm. And then in the middle of the launch process, it will, it will be out later this year, a three-row Edge in China will also launch. So manufactured in China? Manufactured in China. Mm. So truly a world vehicle. And it was all engineered right here in so, uh, Dearborn. W will the Chinese version be dimensionally the same as this car? Well, obviously, with the third row in it, it'll be a little bit longer, and the rear end stands up some more to get you some headroom back oh, there. Oh, interesting. But from the B pillars forward, pretty much the same car. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, you know, the, the body side of this has so much more form than the previous generation. The previous generation was was pretty. Really, uh, it looked heavy, didn't it? It looked somewhat Flat bland. And, yeah. And, uh, but the, so. So in the plant, I mean, were there any issues in terms of stamping and, and uh, getting, getting that character? Again, our stamping operations, world class, they meet with the team while we're still in the studio, and they give feasibility on what the side of the car looks like, even before we start thinking about stamping the first panel. So there's always challenges with stampings because you want to have surface quality that is just optimal. But this car really, really did well with respect to stamping right out of the gate in, uh, in production Great sheet metal quality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So very happy it with it. looks very nice. Scott, the, the whole world seems to be going to <coughs> crossovers, but mm -hmm. this specific segment, the two-row uh, and all that, how's that entire segment doing? So the segment is growing. The utility segment is growing. Here in North America, it's about level. Um, we sell right around 120000 a year. We expect to maintain that. With some added technology and with the export, the volume out of Oakville will obviously increase, and we think we'll do better. Hopefully, the, the customer will like what they see, and the volume will go up. we got room to build more. What do you wish you had for this thing, uh, given what your competitors are delivering? I wish I had keys to drive it. <laughs> <laughs> mine isn't I'm sure you've got, I'm sure you've got one on order. Yeah. Yeah. I did got, order one. Exactly. But it's got push-button start, though, right? Well, yeah, you still you have know. to have a key fob. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you want a fob. You don't need right, a key. Right, I want a fob. Sorry. But what feature content would you love to offer? Well, for obviously, this? in the future, I mean, you brought up autonomous driving. Wouldn't it be nice to sit in your car and text or drive safely and get mm -hmm. some work done on the way to work. So in the future, I, you know, I'm really looking forward to something like that. Everything else is on the car. I don't, with the technology available today, I think we're doing just fantastic. And very interesting. I, I wasn't aware that this was going to Europe as well. Mm. What kind of customer feedback did you get from that? And so, or are you just throwing it out there and oh, seeing what happens? We clearly went to the market in Europe and said, is this something you would want? You know, we have an S Max and a Galaxy in Europe right now. Mm -hmm. This car looks completely different. It looks a little bit more, up, I'd say, way more upscale to the European buyer. It has a lot more technology. And the customers there said they would love to have it. Now, we did put diesel engines in it. We did put right-hand drive um, because that's what their market requires. So I th That alone is pretty impressive, doing right-hand steer. Yeah, it's a, it's a big task. You don't realize how difficult it is until you just see what it takes to put right-hand drive in these cars. Oh, yeah. It's and you're doing, this, you're doing this in Oakville? We're doing it in Oakville, yeah. yes. So we'll ship cars from North America to Europe. And will they have the engines installed here or there? They will have them installed here. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So did you look at the diesel engine for this market? We did, and our, our customer here in North America is not embracing diesel. However, it's an opportunity for the future. Obviously, if we build it there, we can do it. But our customers here right now are focused on, on gas, and our EcoBoost delivers that. Mm hmm you know, you talked uh, a little bit earlier in regard to what Aaron was saying about your three-engine strategy. Could you talk a little bit more about, um, you know, where you see these things positioned? They all have the six-speed yeah, automatic that's, transmission. That's correct. Um, the two-liter is uh, fantastic for fuel. 
It's, it's, our, it's our best for fuel. And it's really pretty peppy as well. The other thing, we've added all-wheel drive available with the 2-liter on the base car. So I think it's, it's going to be the volume engine that people really want to have, and it helps us with fuel economy, it helps everybody with fuel economy. They were saying something like, what, 40% or something like that? It does. Yeah. And then the 3.5 is a great engine. I mean, we've been building it for a long time. It's, it's tried and true, and it's going to last. And it gives you a little bit more engine presence, a little more throaty sound. You hear that V6, and it does give you more power. So they both have 3,500 tow, both available. And then the 2.7 uh, is very, very quick. Uh, I feel great. It's, it's, uh, it feels like you're in a sports car coming off the red light, and uh, the handling is just something spectacular. Mm -hmm. Way cool. Well, uh, look, we're going to take a quick commercial break here in just a minute, but we've got some questions coming in from the audience. I got one more question that I want to ask you as well, but we're going to take a quick commercial break and give a shout out to our good friends at Bridgestone. Is that Jay Giles on there? <laughs> I don't think. Oh no, it's not. <laughs> but it isn't. What is it? Oh, it's your. Hey. hey! Did you have a good nap? The Firestone Destination LE2. <laughs> Tough enough to handle anything the road throws at you and you throw it it. Durable, dependable, Firestone tires. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. Really focused on craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we're back. And uh, one question I wanted to ask you, um, you're making a platinum version of this, right? And you're not that a first, you're, you're, no, not, you're not platinum. No, okay. we have uh, SE is a base car and SEL, and then a titanium. So the titanium has That's replaced, what I'm of. right. Titanium has replaced the limited. So it's very upscale, and then we have the sport that is available. Slightly less precious metal, but hard to weld. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Explorer does have platinum coming, though, so there is a, another opportunity for us in the future to maybe even put more I'd upscale be, material. I'd be very surprised if there wouldn't be a platinum edge coming at some point. I mean, in, in many ways, these are just like pickups. There doesn't seem to be an upper price limit for a lot of these things. People are paying a lot of money for them, especially for leasing. Well, interiors, I mean, are, yeah. are really key now. If, if you can get a very luxurious interior with fantastic leather, you just feel better driving mm. the car. Okay, uh, we've got some questions that have come in from uh, our audience from all over the world. In fact, Marion uh, Kershavelin, and I'm sorry, I'm sure I did not pronounce that properly, but Marion wants to know, will the Edge be sold in Central Asia? In Central Asia. We have a viewer here from Central Asia. Uh, the plans right now are for China. Um, again, an opportunity exists for us there, so we'll look into that. Gotcha. We'd come from that region, but he, we need to assess. He also wants to know, because he must have seen the show that we did uh, with Chris Reed from Nissan, how does the Edge compare to the Murano, Nissan Murano? So I watched that, uh, I watched that same show, and uh, we were talking earlier. I think they are just a revolutionary car. They've taken their car. We came out the same year. I think it was 2006 uh, mm -hmm. for a 2007 yeah. model year. Um, they came out. We came out. We were a little more mainstream with appearance and uh, quickly we took the sales leadership. Uh, same kind of thing happened here. They are revolutionary. We are evolutionary. You see the same cues from the current edge, but they are more refined. So with respect to technology, I believe we have more technology in the car. Fuel is about the same, 24 average. Um, but it's going to be up to the customer to see what's really the leader. It's more engine choices, too. Well, and clearly more engine. Toronto's I think they only one, have one aspirated. The 3.5, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 3.5 aspirated. They've had those zero-gravity seats, so you really don't need right. more. <laughs> yes, that's yeah. true. Just, they are comfortable, though. So that's that advantage of zero-gravity. I think they're comfortable. A lot of my staff doesn't like them, though. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, Dan the Band says, even though Lincoln has a separate studio, was there anything that was supposed to be on the edge that didn't go through due to the MKX? There was nothing that didn't go through. Now, we've clearly, we have discussions around, there's, you're going to see some different technology on MKX, but to put that technology in our Ford Edge would really price us out of the range for the the titanium, the SEL model. So in the future, there may be an opportunity for us to share some of that, but we're going to focus on getting MKX to the really upscale customer, as we should, and our titanium is going to be loved by our buyers. So it's not going to be a Ravel audio system like that? that is Lincoln, <laughs> Lincoln only. We have our own great audio mm. system. Amado Arceo wants to know, does the new sync system have on-screen buttons? He says, my 2010 Fusion does and is flawless. 
My wife's 2013 escape is voice activated only and is frustrating. So, I'm being kind, he says. Yeah, uh, we listened. We heard a lot of that from the customers and you'll find redundant buttons on the IP of the uh, current edge as well. So you can still use the screen, you can still use voice activated, but we do have buttons for, uh, for your use. Thank you for bringing the buttons back, by the way. We listen. From all the journalist community, at least. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mike from Philly wants to know what about a pro program that's not yours, but maybe we'll get an answer out of you. Mm -hmm. He says, the growing popularity of subcompact SUVs, Buick is having a huge success uh, with the Encore. Uh, will Ford clean up the EcoSport, excuse me, the EcoSport, and bring it to the U.S. market? I, uh, I can't, I don't know the answer to that question. I, yeah, would, I, <laughs> I would give you hints if I knew, but I have no idea. What I can tell you is uh, I know it's, our, our Escape is a fantastic car, not quite as small, but it's something people ought to look into. Did you guys learn anything from the launch of the Escape that you applied to the launch of this vehicle? We learned from every launch in every region. Um, everybody puts out lessons learned that we go, as a program manager, we go get those and say, here's some things that didn't go well, we need to go fix those. So we do learn lots of things. Mm -hmm. Abhi Kumar says, I'm just wondering why American and Canadian cars do not have rear fog lights. I was in Europe and almost all cars have rear fog lights. It really helps in bad weather, he says, and for others to see you. So ECE requirements, re you know, Europe requires a rear fog lamp. In North America, we don't. Now, is it a technology, we have the technology, we can put it on there. Our customers right now aren't asking for it. Mm -hmm. We could do it, but uh, we're gonna deliver what the customer so I think it's foggier in Europe than it, it might is be. here. I don't, I don't think most know. Americans would know what to do with a rear yeah. fog so, light. So would that require a different fascia for the rear? That depends on where you mount it. Um, you can mount it higher or lower, but most of the time it does go in the fascia and you have to have some sort of fixings back there. Mm -hmm. Hey, we got a phone call uh, that's just come in too. So Ben, let's bring that in. Hi, this is Warren from the Studebaker Ranch in Paris, California. I'm also a uh, Ford stockholder. Oh. I'm looking at this new Edge and I can't believe it. It's just so knocked down gorgeous. With the front facing camera, I'm wondering if there is or will be possibly a way to connect that so you could record with it, like for the, uh, do the same as a dash cam. So I. Uh, Great show, really enjoying it, great car. Talk to you all soon, thank you. Thanks Bye. for the call, yeah. So the technology clearly would be there. I mean, we can record from that camera. It's not in the vehicle right now. Clearly there may be some, some NHTSA discussions around what it would take to have cameras recording things but an opportunity possibly for us in the future. Yeah, we'll, but think about it. You're on we'll, a nice vacation. You go, oh, what beautiful scenery. Hit record and you got it. What I can tell you is in the media drive last week, I saw lots of GoPros yeah. stationed on the front yeah. of cars. So yeah. obviously it's something that for an opportunity in the future we'll go talk, we'll go talk about. GM's got? Uh, GM's got that. Well, the the performance the, data recorder in the, the Corvette. Oh, for the Corvette. Yeah, yeah. Right. in the rear Part of the track yeah. package. Yeah. 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 Push a button and it records what you're driving and how you're doing it. You yeah. stick it on a USB drive and just... Get Share it. it via Twitter. Yeah. Opportunity mm -hmm. for the future. Mm -hmm. Kind of a clever idea. I really like it. Mm -hmm. What else? What have, we, what have we missed here, Scott? Anything else that well, we should I think, talk about? Again, I think the customer needs to just <coughs> go, go to FordVehicles.com, have a look at all the technologies that are on the car, build and price one of your own, and then go out and drive one because you can't really get a feel for the car until you're in, inside behind the wheel driving the darn thing. And this car is by far the best that we've built. Yeah, it, it, is, very, it is very surprising the degree to which this is a different vehicle yeah. from the last generation vehicle. I mean, you know, you mentioned earlier that, okay, if somebody looks at it, they say, oh, it's an edge, but then you look at it a second time, it's like, well, wait a minute. It's, it's changed entirely, and then the driving experience is is just, yeah. and I think you'd agree with that. I think that. The, the word that we used a lot was sophistication. It yeah. feels it, considerably more sophisticated than the last one in yeah. terms of the chassis dynamics, the steering response and feedback. I mean, even just holding a line through a corner. The electronic power steering is... is E-pass now, yeah. standard in That's the car, a big so I miss that. Be yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the outside draws you in. Once you get inside and drive the car, it's it's something that you yeah. just got to It was have. impressive. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Especially with the package that it delivers. It's quite different, yeah. Very positive. Really cool. Well, we're going to wrap up this segment of the show with you, but uh, Scott, thanks so much for coming on. It's really cool that we've got the vehicle in, in the studio with us as well. And uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, Scott Smith, program manager for the new Ford Edge. Been awesome having great. you on Autoline After Hours. It's truly my pleasure. Thank cool. you. Thank That's you. great. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much. 
We're going to take a, a quick break right now. We'll come back and talk about some of the news of the week and other things that the three of us have been doing. Thanks. You already know that you can listen to AutoLine's Industry Insight in places like YouTube and Stitcher. But did you know that you can also listen to it live in your car? It's simple. Just pair your smartphone with your vehicle's Bluetooth connection or plug into the aux jack. Then navigate to AutoLine.tv using your phone's browser. Find the show you want to hear and click play just like you would on your computer. This is AutoLine After Hours with John McElroy. It's that easy. Never be disconnected from AutoLine's top-notch insider information with AutoLine on the go. So, yeah, I, you guys have driven the Sedge. Yeah. I have not driven the Sedge. And but there it is. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> have to drive it around the block when you're done. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. right? yeah, Shermer doesn't need it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So what else? So we were at Ford today. Mm. We let's were let's at talk Ford. About, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, they're looking at using big data and analytics to design the interiors of their cars. What do you think about that? Well, you know, look, this is an industry that's been designing car interiors for well over a century. And it's what, what I got out of this presentation that Ford said of, you know, they're going to put all these sensors on people, track their eyes, where they go when they first get in a car and what things they kind of dwell on looking and and start to um, uh, measure their emotional response, whether they're excited looking at it or remain very calm. And what I'm getting out of this is, as you know, in any design program, you, you have several design themes, and then you try to figure out which is the best, or should we mm -hmm. take this part of that one and this part of this one and put it all together? My guess is they're looking for more data to help them make those decisions rather than just a gut feel. Doesn't sound like there's much room for artistry left in the yeah, whole and thing. I, I, asked, I asked Maury Kelm, who's the, the yeah. head of design for Ford, I said, you know, Maury, with, with all of this science, what happens to the art? Yeah. Okay, and, and he said, well, we, you know, it's, it's, it's still our job to make it look beautiful, and, and, uh, but we want to make sure that we don't make something that's too distracting. Certainly, we don't want to make something that looks ugly. But, you know, I mean, I got this sort of sense of it is, is that this, this is almost, you know, okay, data is a good thing. It's good to have more information. It's good to have input, feedback, so on and so forth. But, you know, at the end of the day, it seems to me that this is a decision, a decision that someone needs to make. Yeah, I don't think. Rather than this is, this is you know, the, the accumulated data seems to show exactly. this. You see all the, the interiors of the 50s and 60s and there were even 30s and there was some incredible artistry that happened mm -hmm. there. I don't think anybody looked at it and, and thought, you know, what, what will the numbers show us if we start right. polling people about what we've created mm -hmm. here? I'm not even sure why they had the press conference because they admitted themselves, they don't have a name for this process. <laughs> they haven't even finalized on how they're going to use it. And they've done a little bit of this with the Ford <coughs> GT. So why, why the press conference well, about it? Why, why bring in the media to say, here's stuff that we're doing, though we're not even really using it all But, that I mean, much. it seems to me that they, they must be putting a lot of stock in this because, I mean, clearly, I mean, to, I mean they're saying they're basically wiring people's brains to see, That's you know, what, what the, what, you know, <laughs> how, what, you know, how they're feeling about it and, you know, the eye tracking technology yeah. and so on and so forth, you know, all for designing the interiors. And so, I mean, I, I think this is probably a fairly big deal over there and they're saying that, you know, this is what we want to do. And, uh, um, I just I just wonder about whether it's yeah. it's a worthwhile endeavor whether they shouldn't be concentrating on some other things in terms of developing their vehicles. Meanwhile, over at Jeep, they're telling their youngest designer on staff design an interior for the Renegade that you'd like to do, and he's like, cool, and he does one, and everyone yeah. thinks it's fantastic. Right, <laughs> and, and that's, that's exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. I mean, it's that exactly. sort of thing. And then, but he just mentioned the Jeep. Now you saw mm. some some Jeeps from Moab this morning. Yeah, this is really interesting. Every year for the last ten years. Jeep Design has done these concepts that they truck out to uh, to Moab, and if if you're not familiar with it, it's a big off-road jamboree yeah. kind of a yeah. thing that they hold there. And what I found very interesting about it is these are not fiberglass mock-ups; these are all fully capable off-road vehicles, and they've got some really wild ones. Ben, I don't know if you got any pictures that you can start pulling up and. Uh, Okay, uh, yeah, perfect. that one's sort of boring. The Overlander, yeah. yeah. okay, they put a tent on the top. What happens go, when you go, fall one, off oh, the Go back, go back one, Ben. 
Because what, what's interesting about this, they call it the Outlander. Outlander I, or Overlander? I, uh, Overlander? Overlander. Overlander. Excuse yeah. me. Thank you, Aaron. I'm what glad happened? you're on this show. What happened? <laughs> and, and, but what they're saying is there's a trend right now to take your vehicle way out in the boondocks and <laughs> camp with your vehicle as opposed to you know going backpacking or set up a separate tent. So they put this tent on the roof of the thing and it pops up in no time. I mean like, you know, one minute, poop, poop, and, and you're ready. What happens if you accidentally roll the wrong way though and fall five feet off the top of the car? Come on. Break your neck. I mean, come on, of course you gotta be careful. It's a Jeep thing. Yeah, that is, I wouldn't understand. So let's yeah. go to next picture, Ben, that you had up there. Uh, this one they call the Africa, That's cool. which I think is awesome. And if you sort of squint a little bit, it looks like you know, like a, an early 50s or late 40s yeah. Land Rover Defender. Yep. I mean, something that you would see in the African bush. Steel wheels. And you know, they uh, lengthened it. They've got this big door on back. Uh, it's four doors, and and this is fully functional vehicle built right off the Wrangler. Uh, they raised the roof a little bit. They extended uh, the rear uh, because they said, now that there's four-door Wranglers and people are bringing their kids and their dogs and everything, and everyone's bringing their junk, you need more storage capability. That looks but I love the look, and especially the steel wheels. You know, nothing fancy schmancy. You know. Uh, you know, aluminum. It, 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 you know, and this is this is Mark Allen, who's the head of cheap right, Jeep design, right, and he yeah. and his team are sort of like uh, like underground garage that they, they work on these we'll things, work and right. and uh, you know, and they do this every year. And and I think what what is really really interesting about it is that these guys then take these vehicles out to Moab. They play with them, and they play with them, yeah. and, and they play with them, and they, they show customers. They get customer reaction. They learn from this stuff. And, then, and guess what? They'll bring it back to Moab for the next five years. So this isn't something, you know, at an auto show, you pull the cover off and you never ever see it again. And they may actually build some of them, too. They right. did that JK8 pickup truck mm -hmm. right. aftermarket kit. Right. That is well, yeah, so, 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 so the Mopar guys yeah. are, are really keen on what these, these Jeep guys but are I mean, doing. Look oh, yeah. at that Africa kit. That all looked like just plain old sheet mold compound. You right. probably do a mold of that fairly easily, and suddenly you've got yourself a taller, longer, Wrangler, right? Yeah, and it, you know, it, and it also struck me as interesting because they, they also, we, you know, we had the Renegade in the studio a couple weeks ago with uh, Art Anderson, the chief engineer of that, and they have uh, a Cherokee that they they worked on, um, you know. And I got to say, from from my eye, when we look at, at the okay, we just we just saw the Wrangler. Now we're seeing this. I, I got to say, the Wrangler just lends itself so oh, much yeah. more to. Doing things like this, I mean, no, this, this sort of the the oh, authenticity. Well, but wait, of there's Jesus. more. Oh, yeah. show, show, show us one that the yeah, internet lost another, their mind on. Yeah, another picture, Ben. Pull up another. There yeah, it is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Look at this thing. So this is also a, based on the Wrangler. They they call this the Chief. Yes. And if you know your Jeep history, there was a Chief that looked very much like this that came out in the early 70s. I want to say 72 ish, 74 ish. And what's so cool is. Uh, it's very open air. There's there's uh, glass for the front doors, but all the glass there, there is no glass beyond the B pillar. This, this isn't the most open air Jeep that they had there today. Though, no, no, today. no. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get to that one too. <laughs> well, look, then, the internet lost their mind when they saw this this morning. <laughs> I mean, this is it's Cherokee Chief Wagoneer style. Uh, I it see, looks terrific. It looks I mean, so retro. I mean, cool. it's, I mean it's really doesn't retro. that right. doesn't that look like something that you could stick in a showroom yeah, right now and, and sell everyone you can make? Yeah. And being the Wrangler, it's but it's still body on frame, isn't mm -hmm. it? So I mean, how hard could it be to actually come up with different kits for this kind of thing? Another thing that was big for uh, Mark Allen was the color on this. This mm -hmm. pale blue. I mm -hmm. mean, it, it's like a, a baby powder blue kind of a thing. Probably now, who would associate that with G? Yeah. But and, and again, what they're, the interior of this is all uh, got all little kinds of things that allude to surfing. Mm -hmm. So if you picture this on the beach, mm -hmm. boy, that color just just works yep. so well. It's got mm -hmm. this surf rated badge on the side yeah. instead of trail rated. Right. You know, and, and you and you think about you know the the element. Remember when the Honda mm -hmm. Element first came out? Oh, yeah. and it was about for surfers. Okay, so if you were a surfer and you were in Malibu or some place like that, which vehicle would you want? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, amen. Yeah, you'd want the chief. Ben, let's let's pull up another one. There's there's one other one I want to get to here. That one's sort of okay too. Mm. Uh, this one they called what was it? It was like the Red Rock Responder. Yeah, like Red that? Rock there's Responder. No to me, this almost has a, a Paris Dakar mm, vehicle yeah. kind of look to it. But they're bringing this out to Moab yeah, because this was those, like an emergency response vehicle. It had all kinds of tools and whatnot in the back. Exactly. Yeah. They've got you know extra winches and impact guns and you know so if you're broken down out on the Rubicon Trail, mm -hmm. this thing pulls up and you can fix your Jeep. I think if you're broke down on the Rubicon Trail, you want a 
a ram power master to come get you. Yeah. A helicopter. Yeah. Or a helicopter. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm, I'm with you, Aaron. Ben, let's pull up another one, because there's, there's one other that I really want to yeah. get to. This thing. There it is. This is what they call the staff car. Talk about a throwback. And it's, it's made to look like, you know, World War II, 1945, no doors, staff car. Uh, the wheels are 35 inches, if I remember off the top of my head. Very military spec, everything to it. And it looks authentic. Yeah. When you look at it, you go, that can't be a modern Wrangler, but it is. You would cut something off getting out of that driver's seat on the ax that's mounted yeah, that, right that's there. The, possibility. <laughs> the other thing in all these concepts uh, that I think is very cool that absolutely changes the interior, no headrests. Yeah. I just took it off. I mean, it's a concept. You yeah. can get away with it, right? And, uh, but it, it's true, headrests really kind of ruined the, the, the look mm -hmm. of the interior of a car. That kind of looks like a death trap, I gotta admit. I don't know that I'd want to go around on the trails on something that didn't have. You know, what's really cool about these is, is that, you know, there, there are, are rolling concepts, there are concepts that, that move and mm -hmm. drive, and they generally move slowly and drive horribly and don't move very well. But I mean, these guys are taking, you know, real yeah. Jeeps in transforming them like that. And they maintain it's, that yeah. ability. It's just awesome. Yeah. I, I think this is probably why their customers just go gaga over these things, because they know, I could take this on the Rubicon. Mm -hmm. I can take this out on the Slick Rock at Moab. So If they say the right things, they might get able to. They, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And uh, yeah, Mopar is all over this. I, I, I learned today that uh, on average, every Jeep sold has two Mopar accessories on it. <laughs> So, yeah, it's a brand that lends itself to it. Okay, we're going to take another quick break. we got more to talk about. We'll be back in a jiffy. From Shanghai to the Silicon Valley, the auto industry may make news around the globe, but there's only one spot to get your daily dose. Check out AutoLine Daily at AutoLine.tv, Monday through Friday at noon Eastern. AutoLine Daily for the concise word on everything cars. What else, Gary? I know well, you had a list of things. Well, I mean, we, we, we just heard earlier about the desire for autonomous cars, and uh, Tesla made some autonomous news today. Oh, um, what? Because so, so, I've, I've been driving in the car all day. So, so, so basically, and I'm sure we're going to hear from Anton about this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a guy who writes to John and I on a regular basis. Uh, about all about Tesla. Tesla. Uh, all about uh, Tesla. But, but, but so um, they, they had talked about how they were going to make range anxiety a non-issue, and I thought that maybe they were going to somehow magically make the batteries allow you to have greater range, but that's not it. Basically yeah. what they're doing is that, is that they're tracking your vehicle, whether you're using the navigation system or not, mm -hmm. such that it will you know, keep you advised as to your range versus the available ability of power in terms of their supercharger stations or other stations and you know that's nice I mean but you know for for Tesla that they're claiming what 270 mile range so I mean it's like a car so if you don't know to fill up your car then but but the other thing is is that they're gonna do a, a software download and and Musk claims that you could in effect drive from San Francisco to Seattle hands-free hands-free on existing Model S's Okay, not something special, but with, with an existing Model S. So, I mean, but they said mm -hmm. now the problem is is that um, due to regulations and whatnot, driving in communities and in, in, in neighborhoods and things like that, you know, so they're not they're not recommending that anybody just on the highway. Do this. It'd be a highway sort of thing, but that is the sort of no. That's a, well, hey, that's traffic jam assist, right? But at highway speeds, yeah. not you know, limited to forty miles an hour like everyone else is talking yeah. about doing. Mm -hmm. Well, Mercedes Benz has said that the S class is ready to go. That's ready right. for full autonomy. All they have to do is flip a switch. It's yeah. got all the hardware. All they have to do the is lock up their lawyers in a room, and they can exactly. go ahead and right. do yeah, it. But they're ready to do it, too. It's like Tesla's taking a step in front of them. But we'll see. I'm not entirely convinced that it's entirely safe for everybody involved. Well, you look, of course there's going to be an accident at some yeah. point. Yeah, so, well, you know, we'll find out what their tolerance for litigation is. Yeah. But I think this is the way the industry is going. I yeah. think it's a good thing, and uh, I, I'm all in favor of it. And, you know, and, and I, there was, so, so Chris Urmson, who is in charge of the Google Autonomous Car Project, and he, he made a, a, a speech um, Tuesday at the TED conference. They had one up in Vancouver. And, and this was one of the most interesting quotes I've ever read about developing 
autonomous technology, okay? So, so the whole issue is, is this going to be an incremental thing? Is this that as, as you add this technology and then we'll get more and more autonomous? And that seems to be the, the direction that uh, most car makers seem to be taking. And, and so he, he said, and this is a quote about you know, this, this incrementalism in, in, in developing, and he goes, that's like me saying, if I work really hard at jumping, one day I'll be able to fly. <laughs> So, so basically saying that if you're going to do this, mm -hmm. you're going to do this, yeah. right? I mean, this isn't a matter of we're going to add this, we're going to add, you know, park assist, we're going to yeah. add lane keeping, you know, that, that basically, okay, you've got to develop the technology to do it. Yeah, no, you, you, you got to go headfirst into the pool. And the reason I say this is I, I think the big danger for the industry is not level four, fully autonomous cars, get in and say, take me home, and it does it. The real dangerous part is level three, where it's semi-autonomous mm -hmm. and your car tells you at some point, beep, 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 now you have to take control. But what if you got your laptop in your lap, yeah. you know, and you're scribbling something and with coffee your, in your, your other hand? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Having a nap. Right. <laughs> yeah, you're a nap. <laughs> so to me, that's the real, you know, that's where the lawyers are really going to get involved is more with level three cars than with level four. Mm -hmm. But the other thing, going back to Chris Urmson, that I thought was the most significant thing that came out of it is he said Google is not going to build cars. Hmm. And I had an interview with Ron Medford, also involved, former NHTSA uh, uh, executive, uh, now working for Google. So as recently as last October, he told me it, Google was not decided yet hmm. whether it was going to build cars or just license its technology. Well, so want? for Ermson to come out and say, we're not going to build cars, to me is a big announcement. Mm -hmm. Why would they want to? I mean, I mean that's the, the trouble and, and expense, and mostly the expense of trying to build a car is extreme. I mean, if well, you've got companies that'll buy your systems. And he said, this systems, was the, yeah. the quote that I liked. He said, you know, we've learned that building cars is really yeah. complicated. Oh, yeah. And the car companies are actually pretty good at it. Right. Yeah, I mean, so w w what do these guys know about stamping and welding right. and all that sort of thing? You know, right. I mean, it's just, it's just not. Well, they don't make anything anyway. Right. right? right. So, so it would be, you know, the... the necessity for them to do that. The investment would be ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't make sense. But man, and uh, um, NVIDIA, and I think Danny Shapiro, you've talked to him maybe. Yeah, we've had him on, uh, on the TV on show. show and, right. uh, um, they, just, they just came out with these new processors for autonomous cars and uh, saying uh, they can weave together data streaming from 12 cameras, um, driver assistance features to run simultaneously, surround view, collision avoidance, pedestrian detection, mirrorless operation, cross traffic monitor, Driver state monitoring, so it can you know if you're taking that nap, mm -hmm. it can probably wake yeah. you up before you need See, to. See, that, that's interesting because you crash. I don't want to be woken Google up and everyone else are taking two different approaches to autonomy. Google is it's a mapping based system, mm -hmm. and why? Because they, they're the mapping yeah. leaders in the world, right? Sure. Everybody else doesn't have that capability, so they have to go for much more precise measurement of exactly where the car is, mm -hmm. not just on a map but to its surroundings. And I gotta believe that this new NVIDIA processor, where you're saying you can synthesize 12 cameras at the same time, that's going to give these guys, the others, the non-Googles that are working on autonomy, probably the kind of precision that they're looking for. Right, and then they're saying it's a neural network, so it will learn under driving conditions, it'll learn behaviors and so on and so forth, yeah. And to the point of, uh, of Google, they're logging three million miles in simulators every day. <laughs> in addition to real-world driving tests. so um, Someday this is all going to come together where the actual self-driving car and your healthcare company are going to get together, and it's not going to let you drive through a Taco Bell anymore. It's going to take control and say, sorry, we can, we've, we've talked yeah. wirelessly with your healthcare You've provider. You've already had 5,000 calories exactly, today. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. You just wait. This is coming. So, so we see that um, number of uh, car manufacturers are pulling out of Russia and yeah. uh, the Russian economy tanking. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gee, boy, it, it is yeah. nose diving. Yeah. yeah. And and the other thing too is the cars are doing bad, trucks even worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Medium and heavy trucks. Mm -hmm. And you know that's what drives so much of any country's economy. And and I, I want to say car sales are down almost forty percent, but I want to say medium and heavies are down seventy percent. Jesus. 
Yeah, so, so you mentioned General Motors pulling out, and so mm -hmm. I thought, hmm, I wonder how many cars General Motors actually sells there. So I contacted them and said, you know, what are your sales in, in yeah. Russia? So, so last year, GM global sales were 9.9 .9 million and change, okay, global sales. Okay, of that, in, <laughs> in 2014, they sold, this would be a quiz, guess how many Cadillacs they sold in Russia in 2014, the whole year? 14. I saw the number in your book, so I can't. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. 1,804? 24. 24. 24. 24, yeah. 1,324 cars. So in the first two months of this year in the United States, Cadillac has told, sold 23,419 cars, and we all say Cadillac isn't doing very well in this country, right? I mean, we're all like, oh, Cadillac sales are down. Okay, for the entire year of 2014, yeah. they, they sold, 14. you know, Chevrolet in 2014. I'm not going to make you guess because you read that. Okay. It's 123,175 vehicles in Russia for the entire year. Now, again, look at Chevy sales in the United States, first two months of the year. Um, 302,670 vehicles. I mean, so it's just like. They're not missing, I, they're not missing no, anything. They're not so, missing even anything. so, I think it's a mistake for GM to pull out of Russia. Mm. And, and the only reason I say that is, you know, until Putin went crazy and into Crimea and all that, got all the sanctions down on his head, Russia was one of the places that looked really promising. Yeah. Then, and everybody was forecasting that it was going to surpass the German market in yeah. total total vehicle it's, sales. It's the R. Three million brick. plus. We talk about the you know, brick. they'll be lucky right. if they do a million and a half this year. Yeah, but I mean, so, but I mean, even in 2013, before all this happened, I mean, General Motors sold a grand total of 257,583 cars. So, I mean, that was in 2013. Yeah, I know, this Gary, was but pre quarter million cars is you know, sounds bad. to me like the old GM way of doing things. Hey, we'll get in. Oh, it's not working. Okay, we're out. And, you know, where's your strategic planning? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, was your strategy just to see, well, let's see if we can do anything, Throw or was it to take, say, yeah. this is a country that's going to have significant sales at some point, post-Putin, this is a country that we're going to have yeah. to probably get back into. It's like they're in and out with Chevrolet in Europe. Well, plus, they were developing all kinds of joint ventures, too. They had at least two that I know of. Yeah. And Optiva is one of them, and there's mm -hmm. another one that they'd actually, they were building things together with some of the Russian companies in Russia. Mm -hmm. Right, but if we look at it, I mean, there's, there's less than a production plant volume that they're selling. True. So, I yeah. mean, that, you got you to take those costs into account. I, I understand. I understand. But, you know, it... Again, to me, it says something about their long-term planning that it's like, oh, we got a problem, we're bailing. Mm. Well, I'd go to China. <laughs> Just like, They're already in China. They're I know, right, but I mean, that's where I put my investment China. there. Come on, that's well, what you need to be doing. Be, they are still going to be selling a couple of models there, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, Corvette. Russia, Corvette, Tahoe, Corvette, or Suburban. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Camaro. Camaro. Yeah. 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 And uh, Tons of demand for Camaro. All, yeah, all I, those, I, it, well, St. Peter's. All those made in USA, or yep. at least for now, made in Canada when it comes yeah. to Camaro, but that's yeah. going to change. Mm -hmm. What else, Gary? What else, what else, what else? What else has been happening this week? Well, I spent last week, uh, went down to the Edge Drive. Yeah. And you were down there, but I spent the rest of the week down there doing a mid-size pickup comparison test. How'd that work out? It's very interesting. We had the Canyon, we had the Colorado, we had the Nissan Frontier Pro 4X, and the uh, Toyota Tacoma TRD Pro. And everybody sent their top four-wheel drive off-road pickup in the mid-size category, except now, for the Canyon. The Canyon was not. Okay, so were the... Were the so, so was the was the Toyota the new one or no? So it was the last. It was the last one. Yeah, because the new one's not out yet. Okay. Yeah, the new one won't be here. Until I thought maybe the end of the year. It was you. Well, they, you know, they might have sent you. We we on. well we asked, believe me. But the the idea was, I mean, then there was a valid point. So why would you have this comparison test if at least one of these two Japanese trucks going to be changing? But it's not coming until the end of this year. So I mean, pretty much for 2015, if you're looking for a midsize pickup, these are your choices. This is all you've got. So. The interesting thing was the one that I like driving a lot was, I can't give any results why not because they're still being compiled and not the data, the testing that's gone on. I like the Pro 4X. I like the Nissan Frontier. It's old and it's small, but in crude terms of, and crude, but off-road, it was fun. We had an off-road portion that's actually this, like one of those Baja style tracks where they jump the trucks and whatnot. But it was it was a great time. Probably the smallest of them too. It was right? the smallest of them. So more compact, more nimble. It, it felt much more like a compact. So, so, so how did how did the new GM vehicles 
I mean, in just in your impression, yeah. your impression of them. There's, it's, it's hard to make a direct comparison because the two Japanese pickups were the most extreme off-roaders that they had. And the most extreme off-roader was the Z71 package for the Colorado. And it doesn't have quite not that the extreme, same, no, right. it's not a ZR2. Like we saw the ZR2 concept in LA and we're kind of hoping that they'll make one of those because it looks like a lot of fun. So, so is it, I mean, when we were looking at those, those Wranglers earlier, I mean, is, is, it, is it sort of the thing that, you know, you had this sense that, that the, the Japanese old, comparatively old pickups were more authentically like that? Yeah. They I mean, really and, are. and that's so it's sort of like, you know, you're hardcore guy. This is what you're going to this is really what you're going to want. When we got in, uh, we do a, a family day where we have a man on the street who's in the market for these vehicles, comes and gives us some opinions. And he owns an 05 Frontier and he gets into the new one, gets into the 15. He's like, this is exactly the same. It doesn't it literally doesn't feel any different than my current 05 Frontier. And that's one of the things they haven't really changed very much on them. It's like buying a brand new 10-year-old car mm -hmm. in many ways. But if you like those old trucks, and a lot of people still like these trucks, right. it's okay. It's actually fun. The Tacoma still outsells all the rest of the field by right. almost two-to-one margins. Yeah. But Toyota never gave up on the segment. Yeah. They always treated it seriously. But they didn't do much with no, it. No, because they had it to themselves. Yeah. So they, they've been coasting on their laurels. So it'll be real interesting to see the next one that comes along. Yeah. Did they have enough time in their program to react to the GM vehicles? Because I'm sure they were, all the hard points must have been already set on yeah. that truck, for example. And I just wonder if they had enough time to go, ooh, we better do this and we better mm -hmm. do that. It wouldn't take much. I think, to update the current Tacoma into something a bit more dramatic, and at least a bit more updated. There are certain elements like the bed depth. The bed depth on the two Japanese pickups is considerably less. than and It's supposed to be 18 inches, but you look at the Colorado and Canyon, they almost feel like a full-size pickup. Right. They drive like full-size pickups. They feel much more, uh, I don't want to say sophisticated, but considerable in terms of their mass. And See, but the, the that, that, that leads to the question whether the buyer of a midsize pickup wants that necessarily. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just like, it, it almost seems like, oh yeah, that's what you want. You want to be a full-size, no, no, no. Because if you wanted a full-size pickup, I mean, the deals are out there such yes. that you could, you could get one. I mean, it's not a problem. Well, the interesting part is that we had a, a GMC Canyon, the SLT, which is their, their volume model, but has pretty much loaded. It was about 40 grand. And to get into a Sierra SLT, you're looking at about ten to $12,000 more for that truck. Hmm. And it's just as nice as the Sierra was in terms of content and features. It has forward collision warning radar and, and backup cameras and everything you pretty much need that they'd have on the full size. Hmm. Look, I, I got to believe that GM is grinning from ear to ear with these compact trucks. Yeah. They're selling well, mm -hmm. and it has not cannibalized the big no. ones. So, you know, if, if I look at the numbers and extrapolate, it looks to me that, like they're easily going to sell over 100,000 uh, canyons and Colorados this year mm -hmm. and, and not put a dent in their bigger trucks. And so that's all pure plus volume for yeah. those guys since, right. well, since their last trucks have been. It's Ranger owners who've been waiting for a new Ranger and Ford's trying to sell them on the Transit Connect as a good replacement for that. And they're like, it's just not the same. No. It really is. Yeah, it's the nature of the vehicle. Yeah. It's entirely different. No, pickup buyers want pickups, yeah. not some little van. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and you're, it, you're driving a big van I'm right now. the big transit. I am blown yeah. away. Isn't it great? I mean, this is like the big cargo van for enthusiasts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm, I'm knocked out. I, I was uh, went out mountain biking last night, and I'm driving back from the park. I almost started giggling that I like this thing that much. The steering is so precise. The, the, the cornering dynamics, and I've got the high roof version. This thing's got to be 10 feet tall. Even the it, turning it's circle. gigantic. The turning the circle, turning is, circle is, is acceptable. Yeah. Uh, I'm telling you, I, I couldn't, going into it, I never thought I was going to enjoy driving a big box van like that so much. So, so, so what's, what's the deal with all of these Euro-style vans? I mean, why, why have they suddenly come here? Why have they suddenly become so popular? I think for two reasons. Number one is the domestics, GM Ford and the then Chrysler, coasted on their old body-on-frame vans forever. Mm -hmm. I remember when my dad got an Econoline for the family, we're a big family, 1976. That's when that stupid van came out. Mm -hmm. I say stupid, I, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> because they did update it and they yeah. made changes, but man, the tooling was paid off for probably in the Reagan administration. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and Chevy did the same thing with the Express and, and GMC with Savannah. the Savannah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chrysler dropped theirs because, during the, the Daimler Chrysler days. Yeah. And that's when the Sprinter came over. 
And you talk to anybody who has a Sprinter, man, they love that thing. Love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pricey, but total cost of ownership, that's where the story is. Yeah. And so, you know, here comes time to start thinking about for GM and, and uh, Ford, geez, maybe we ought to start replacing these things that have been around forever. And guess what? Ford says, hey, our whole strategy is one Ford. Whatever we sell in the world, we're going to sell in the world. So instead of doing an updated Econoline, why don't we just bring over this van that's already proven? And I, I think it's working for them. Yeah. Uh, on the screen, John. Oh, it's up on the... Uh, there it is. Oh, it's sitting on the parking lot. That's the front window. At, at the big mamu, I call it. <laughs> and it looks so ungainly. You know, it... Styling-wise, that is not an attractive van, certainly not with that big roof. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's so worse. damn huge. I mean, there's not a whole lot you're going to be able to do with that. I right. mean, No, it's... I know. And look how inky-dinky the wheels look to the rest of the van. They look <laughs> totally out of proportion. That's true. But, but i, I got to tell you. It's I, not top-heavy at all, though. I've shown, no, it's... Skateboard wheels. Yeah. yeah and uh, all of my friends that I bring in and say, look at this thing, they all get inside and they go, look at this, you can stand up and walk around. And to a person, they've said, man, you could have a party in here. Now, maybe that's something about the van that's eliciting it, or yeah. maybe it's just the kind of people I hang out with. But everybody <laughs> thinks this is a great party machine. Have you driven the Ram ProMaster, the no, full-size no, Ram version? It's awful. It's nothing like the Transit. It's nothing like the Sprinter. It's got this strange seating position where you feel like you're going to fall forward over the dash. It's front drive as opposed to rear drive. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel anything like the other two in, in the market, and it's, I really wonder how it's going to do on that. Yeah, no, I haven't driven that one. So, so Dynamically, speaking, very different. Speaking, speaking of this, this Ram vehicle, so, so what, what do you make of Sergio saying that he's open to the possibility of a merger with another car company? Where's that coming from? <laughs> yeah, where is that coming from? Yeah. I mean, I, I, everyone's been talking that we're going to see more mergers in this business. But very interesting that Sergio is like bringing it up on his own. Right. And I got to believe it's his way of using the media to let every car mm -hmm. company in the world know, hey, <laughs> I'm open to a deal. Yeah. Let's talk. Yet he keeps telling Volkswagen that he's not going to sell Alfa Romeo. Like, Sorry, well, you can't have that part. Okay, but I, mean, but I mean, do you think he wants to to take the whole ball of wax and say, okay, this is what you, we're, you're going to merge with? Well, the thing is, who, who would it mesh well with? I mean, the only thing I can think of are Chinese. Well, I, I, I'm with you on that one. I, I'd say I'd take a strong look at Peugeot. I mm. think Carlos Tavares is really turning that thing around. And you also notice that Sergio has said Fiat is no longer a mass market brand for Europe. Mm -hmm. They're going to concentrate just in A and B class cars. That's where it's going to be an entry level brand. So then you think, okay, what else have you got? Well, they're not going to do Chrysler. The, mm -hmm. Those plans are over. Lancia can't be sold outside of Italy. There must be a law of the universe on that because it just hasn't worked. So, so your, your gap is going to go from Fiat to Alfa Romeo and a little bit above that to Maserati. That's a huge gap in between. And when you look at what Peugeot's doing, especially Citroën and the Citroën DS brand, mm -hmm. boy, to me, pff, you could put PSA right in between Fiat brand and Alfa Romeo brand. That's a good thought. So th there's a thing for Europe, and then who's gonna get Mazda? I mean, here's this little gem of a company mm -hmm. that just does all kinds of great things, but hasn't been able to break out, never has been able to get the scale. So if I were Sergio, first and second on my list would be PSA and Mazda. And then to your point, Aaron, I'd look at one of the independent Chinese companies because they need a more significant presence in China. And me personally, I'd look at Geely, uh, I think very interesting. Or I'd look at Great Wall, which is, yeah. you know, really good. Geely, now, Geely's got Volvo, so yeah, how, right. would, how would that mesh? I don't know. I'm just looking for an, a, a well-run Independent, i.e., not state-owned, yeah. no government, nothing, you know, but but well-run Chinese operation. And and when I look at Geely, they're not that great right now. But having talked to P Peter Horbury, who's doing all their design, he's hyper bullish on the future of that yeah, company in China. Right yeah. mm -hmm. And and Peter, I got a lot of respect for. So, mm -hmm. so it, it, maybe it would be Cherry. Maybe it would be some, but. Yeah, I mean, the legs of the stool are that Fiat is now very weak in Europe. Why not get a partner there? It's got, you know, the Chrysler Group in North America. Fiat's actually very strong in Latin America, mm -hmm. and it's virtually non-existent in China. So 
the, you know, the weak links are Europe and China plus Japan. So, so you can't really use Mazda for that inroad into China. No, either. no, yeah. so you no, that would be right. that would be your Japanese card. Yeah. Yeah, and even then, that's not the growth market that it used to be, especially with an aging population. Oh, the, so. the not sale, at all. The sales of yeah. cars in Japan. No, but I, I, I would go after Mazda export. just because I think it's a pretty good. Okay, but why has, doing, why has, why has, I mean, so, so Ford used to have Mazda, right? Yeah. And then gone. I mean, so, so why hasn't a major car company gone after Mazda? Well, they, are, they do have that tie-up with Fiat. They're going to do the Roadster. They right. do, right? So we'll see. And, Maybe and that's so the, test it's the, the and that's the MX5 yeah, platform. Yeah, Why do mega mergers? Why not just say, "Hey, Gary, you got a, a car, and I like what you're doing, and I need to get in that segment, but I can't afford it. So let's partner up." And hey, Aaron, yep. you know you got this great engine. Why don't we? And you know, look at what uh, Nissan, Renault are doing, partnering with Mercedes, Mercedes Benz, mm -hmm. and. I think partnerships are the smarter way to go, but I don't well, know. In the there's, there's, there's probably a limit to that, however. In the days, in, the, in this day of the information age and the internet, where everybody can see where everything is, you can't. You'd have to limit some of those partnerships to things like what Mercedes Benz is doing with engines and, and powertrains. If you try and rebadge a vehicle from another market, people in that new market know what that is. Well, we we're, we're, we're talking it, about these, mess with your these commercial vans, and yeah. General Motors is going to be um, selling the, uh, the Nissan. Nissan. Yeah. yeah. In this market, and mm -hmm. you can buy the Nissan in the this market. The, the, yeah, the city, well, like, or Express City, or something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, what would you do, Gary? Partnerships, mergers. Why do you think Sergio's doing this? I I think that that perhaps he he wants to get while the getting's good. The the car industry's mm -hmm. on an upswing. Um, you know, European markets coming back. You know, Jam Japan market's not so good. No. U.S. market's coming back, and he's looking at this and saying, you know what? I put this company together, I have it all arranged. Why not take the opportunity now while things are on a positive upswing? Mm, that's a, sort of, and I, I like that thinking because, you, you know, the, the one thing that FCA does not have is enough cash to pull off their plan. Mm -hmm. So there is one way to do it, try to get more cash and or why not split the costs with somebody? Mm -hmm. And now maybe you do have the cash to pull off the plan. Right, so I think that's why it'd be happening. Very interesting, though. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh... it's a fascinating business. That's why we do a show about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, we ought to wrap up. Okay. And uh, But, Aaron, great having you here. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Good show. Really good show. Thank you. And Gary, let's do it again next week. We'll do that. Okay. Cool. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.